Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast where we are rediscovering the ancient way. Thank you so much for tuning back in today over at pathtozion.com or right here, of course, on our YouTube channel. And uh, obviously this is another outdoor edition. We have been getting cold, um, but I can't help being out here. And so bear with me until we get back down into the studio and into some normal, more teaching type stuff, which will be, of course, of course forthcoming. Um, I just want to talk for a few minutes about Sukkot, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths. And as you can see, there are a few remains still yet here on our property um, from our awesome week of, of camping outdoors under a sukkah, a tent, a tabernacle, um, a temporary dwelling. And I just wanted to talk to that point for a few minutes and, and highlight a few things. I, I did a teaching time during our gathering here. We had, depending on when you showed up, anywhere from 15 to 30 plus people here on the property. Some stayed um, uh, camping here and some would come and go during the day. And it was just, it was just really an incredible time. And I just want to talk for a few minutes about three main things as opposed to an actual, you know, well, what is tabernacles and uh, biblically, what are we commanded to do and all those things. And I may tackle that again at a later date, but just three things I want to talk about, of course, is, is number one, the remember and or celebrate, um, make a memorial and, and remember Yahweh's holy appointed times, his, his feast days. And the unique thing about tabernacle specifically is the, is the expanse of time that it covers, that, that you have the full seven days of, of tabernacling um, with Yahweh himself. And then you have the eighth day, which is the way I worded it the other day, is, is Yahweh, <laughs> his incredibleness is demonstrated in the eighth day reality that we even see in the Gospels with Yeshua. <sighs> even after a full week of a set-apart, Moedim feast season appointed time. Yahweh says, you know what? Can we do this one more day? Let's have another day of solemn rest where you uh, 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 gather again and, and allow me to meet with you. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and it's such a, an incredible invitation. So I want to talk about that, of course. And then I want to find, I want to talk about finding your people. Finding your people. We'll talk about that briefly. And then and, and the, the main point I want to make is, is the addition of feasts and Sabbath to the now in Messiah reality in this age that we now live in, in the new covenant. We, of course, are on the other side of Yeshua Messiah, accomplishing and fulfilling so many prophecies that preceded him. And he, of course, instituted this new covenant that the prophets foretold. And, and we now live in that. But if we're not careful, and if we carry on the traditions of our fathers and the errant Christian doctrine we've been handed that, that hands us a twisted Pauline gospel, we miss the addition and we make it a replacement. And so I just want to submit for consideration within this time that we'll talk today about uh, uh, a consideration for you to add instead of replace. And so just a couple things I do want to hit from things that I shared here last week, right here on our property amongst just awesome brothers and sisters, just gathering and celebrating Yahweh's incredible feast of tabernacles, Sukkot. Uh, now I'll hit that point later. <laughs> but, but I'll just jump right into Colossians chapter 2, which talks about these things about don't, don't let anyone pass judgment on you for what you do and what you don't do in regards to what? Food, drink, festivals, new moon, Shabbat, Sabbaths. These are a foreshadowing of things to come, but the body is Messiah. And I made this point the other day, and I'll do it again here, is no one's arguing that point that the, that the body, the, the rep representation, the object of the foreshadowing is, yes, Yeshua Messiah himself. But just because the object has arrived does not in any way scripturally indicate that we throw out everything that pointed us to him. Why? 
because it still points to him. It still points to him and what he accomplished, and it points to what he will accomplish in a day that is yet before us, what he will fulfill and accomplish for those who walk this ancient path reality of what? Remembering Father's ways, remembering Father's patterns, remembering his his Moedim appointed feasts, his appointed times marked out for his people. And so the foreshadow was cast by what? An object. An object, the body. Here was Yeshua himself, of course. And so, and we are commanded to rejoice during this set apart seven days, these, these days of, of rejoicing and, and being full of gratitude because it was, of course, marked at the end of the harvest. And it was when everybody had gathered in all of their crops for the year and they sat back and they literally, to the depths of their being, something I often say we just can't understand because we're not dependent upon the land like they were. We're not dependent upon Yahweh's provision like people generations ago, thousands of years ago. We now have everything we need down the road at the Dollar General whenever we want to just drop a few dollars to go get it. But friends, the mentality of back then was, look, if there's a drought, if there is a fire, if there is, you know, flooding rains and and all these different things, they were so dependent upon their harvest, friend. And so when the harvest came in, they were full of gratitude of, Father, you have again filled our storehouses, literally, with the, the, the life-giving food and provision. And we believe it comes from the Elohim of all Elohims. Of course, there are a lot of little E Elohims, and other people attributed their, their produce and their harvest and their, their animals and, and their literal lives to these, to these lesser deities, of course, as an ancient understanding where they depended upon their deity for provision. Now, of course, we know the word of Elohim tells us that they have, no, they have mouths but can't speak and eyes but they can't see and all these things. In other words, they can't do anything, but the Elohim of all Elohims is the provider and the sustainer of all things and especially to his people. And so when the people gathered thousands of years ago and we are trying to remember and get into our modern Christian American mindsets that, you know what, we are still dependent. We're still desperately dependent upon Father's provision. And friend, a day may come where we're more dependent than we've ever been, but that's for a whole other day. But in Deuteronomy, it talks about uh, tabernacles. Seven days you will feast to Yahweh your Elohim, and you will be completely filled with joy. And then it goes through you, you bring gifts unto Yahweh. Don't come empty-handed. It first appeared in Genesis chapter 33 where Jacob journeyed to Sukkot to build a house for himself. Actually, the first booths that were ever erected were for Jacob's animals, for his livestock. But this pattern goes throughout Scripture about the Sukkot understanding, the temporary shelter, the tabernacling, the leading through the wilderness, and it makes its way all the way to us here, which is what? We are sojourners here, people. We are in these temporary bodies of flesh and we are temporary and we are not to put roots down here in this, this nationalism-based, back and forth, um, politically fueled banter that so many believers are even sucked into, picking sides and hating, brother hating brother and, and, and advancing in the, in the, in the, marketplace with our businesses and with our success and with our homes and with our land. Friends, we too have the exact same issues that all of humanity has ever had, just in a modern day version, in our own way, same challenges to what? Come out from among them, friends, and be separate. Don't do what the world does. Look different, look marked, look set apart, just like what? The set apart, holy, appointed times for a set apart holy consecrated people okay we are a, we are to be a peculiar people as we talked about an episode or two ago we are to be a peculiar odd people i'm telling you man when we had we had some some brothers and sisters park a, a school bus with a with a big chimney sticking out of it and smoke rolling out and we had a, a, a suburban up there with people staying in the back of it and we had pop-up tent here and a 
teardrop camper here and our giant tent here and people all about and coming and going and shofars blasting and I'm just telling you now it's just not it's not just that we're not just trying to make a scene and do you see us odd folks up here it's not that at all and this leads me to one of my three points well so we'll go there now friends we are to be strange here we're to be strange and I'm speaking to my generation um, who who probably many of you came through the early 2000s of like modern church and seeker sensitive church and let's be relevant believers because if if we're not doing what Jesus did and Paul was all men all things to all men and all these things we've misunderstood if we're not just like the world if we're too strange they'll never ever be intrigued to know Jesus but friends that is such backwards doctrine it's such horrible theology to think that we have to become worldly and like the world to win the world to Messiah it's hogwash we by by mere existence of clinging to the word of Elohim and doing what it says including keeping his appointed times Friend, there's nothing in the world that would mark us more as a holy consecrated people than keeping his set apart times. It is a marker. Even Shabbat, Sabbath is what? This is to be a sign between me and you. And, and when people see that you keep this day holy, you are marked by that. You are a set apart people just by memorializing Yahweh's appointed times. And so friend, again, it's not a display of let's see how crazy we can be up here on the hill. It is an outflow of embracing our identity the best way we know how today with flaw and error and we're trying to work these things out. And right here at this campfire, there's discourse about, well, I don't agree with that. Have you considered this? Well, I, th I think that that's just completely off. Can you show me that verse? And like, we're working out our salvation, our understanding, our, through the interaction of the brethren, we are striving to find truth together the best way we can when people gather in humility, which is of utmost importance, and we will get to that as well. But when we were up here, friends, my neighbors drive by, slow looking up here like what in the world is going on now they were already kind of hard to hard to peg and like i can't figure them out we've been called mennonite we've been called amish generally it boils down to most of my neighbors just call us religious thankfully some of them were able to come and peer in a little bit and listen to some of the dialogue of why we're here and what we're doing in the feast of, of yahweh and like i've never heard of that and and friends, I'm just saying, like, why do lifelong Christians, people who have been believers, why have we heard of these, why have we never heard of these things in 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of church attendance? Why have we missed the entire front of the book? It's very intriguing to me, is it not? Because why? Right now, friends, there's people looking into the front of the book. There's people asking questions about, about Sabbath. There's a brother calling me saying, I feel like Holy Spirit's leading us to the Moedim. Can you tell me anything about it? And here and there and there and there, and there's thousands of people over in this state, and there's thousands of people in this state. There's 500 people an hour and a half from here. There's another a group of 100 plus less than an hour from here. There's 30 or so people right here, and why in the world? Because the ancient way, friend, is being poured out onto the earth with understanding and insight and curiosity for anyone who says, you know what? I know nothing. What I've been handed has not cut it. And what I even am learning and adding to my life, there's something missing. There's so many people looking and looking and looking Sadly, so many are looking in the old wells. They're looking in the old wells in the sense of really new. They're looking in just what their father handed them. Discipleship and Bible studies and missions. And friend, I'm not saying all those things don't, don't have a place. But friends, without the undergirding foundation that Torah, which is the Bible, contains and delivers to Yahweh's people about how to be his set apart people. If we don't have that, friends, we don't have the fuel to get the vehicle moving down the right direction. We have no 
right fuel to fuel us to move into advancing the kingdom if we don't even present the full gospel because we ourselves do not even know it. That was a mouthful and I'm sorry. <sighs> Find your people, friends. Find your people. I'm a hesitant guy with relationships. All of us have been hurt. All of us have been wronged. All of, oh yes, I know. We're not here to whine about, oh, Brother Jim back in 1889 called me out in front of the assembly and I've just never quite recovered from that day. I can never go back to church. I'm not talking about that. Some of us have real, like, I wouldn't call them hurts, but just we endeavored to be the Acts church. We endeavored to be Yahweh's people the best we understood at the time. And we, we didn't, I don't like saying we failed, but it just didn't come to fruition like we had thought and like our hearts desired. Yahweh did incredible things in my family specifically and others. Beautiful things that will last forever that changed my life for the better and has, has been part of my journey to get me to where we are. But friend, find your people. Find your people, friend. So many people I know are still just isolated here and there, or they're in groups where they're like, I just don't feel like we're moving. I don't feel like we're progressing where Holy Spirit's leading my family. And what I'm not saying, to be absolutely clear, and please hear me, I am not saying run to the internet and look for people just like you and then move there. I'm not saying that. I'm saying as a family here, we constantly say, Father, lead us to your people or lead your people here. Lead us to your people or lead your people to hear where we are. Whatever you want to do, we're open. Why? Because we need your people. We need people, Father. We need perspectives that we don't have and don't arrive at, my wife and I. We will be deficient in our own selves, as I say all the time. We'll be lacking the fullness. The conversations we had on this property for those seven days were so incredible. Why? Because I'm hearing your opinion. Not just opinion like, well, you know what I think about Leviticus chapter 23 is this. But no, let's look at the Hebrew word for moon. Let's look at the calendar. Let's look at Yeshua's fulfillment and accomplishment and yet what is before us that he's not yet fulfilled and accomplished. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And in that discourse, we have a nugget here. We have a piece here. We have a facet here. And Holy Spirit in his what? Lead us into all truth. He will be our teacher, yes. Holy Spirit will be our teacher. But he might be our teacher by assembling little pieces from what? Other brothers and sisters who are the living stones that Father has set around me in whatever capacity to bring truth into my life and into my household. You, friend, will be deficient to the end of your days to the utmost if you are alone. I don't care what anybody says. I see the fruit of it all around me. Alone, alone, alone. When was the last time you changed your doctrinal stance towards X? When was the last time you moved past just dying to self? I, you can see the fruit on the tree. Same, same, same. The clock is ticking and nothing's moving. Why? I saw it in my own life, friend. I would see it now if I chose to just, would I not learn? Oh, I would learn. I would study. I would pray. I would meet with my family and we would open the word and we would talk and we, we would learn. We would grow, but it is stunted when we are alone. Why? Because it, it opposes father's design. We cannot say we understand nor live out the living stones reality. If we are a stone on a hill with a wall around it, doors locked, gates shut down, leave us alone. It will not work, friend. We have got to be like this in a rightful measure, which I will get to in a minute, to say, Father, where are your people? Where are your people? Uh, a sister who is here, she said this. I don't know if she came up with it herself and it was some great cre creative moment or if she's heard somebody else say it, it's really irrelevant. But she said, like mind, like kind. And oh, I like, oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Like mind, like kind. Humble. Resigned to be right all the time. No interest in just putting your foot down saying, this is final. <laughs> Yielded to the plurality of the body and submitting 
things for consideration. Trying to find Yahweh's ways. Like mind. Like kind. What is that? My interpretation, not hers. A, a people gathering in the like-mindedness of Messiah to say what? This isn't about you. Guess what? This isn't about me. This is a capital P people, friend. If you can be a part of a people, then come on in. But if you're looking to come on this property and put your name on the billboard, keep on trucking. And I'm just finally at the point in my life where, you know what? I'm okay with that. Addition. I want to touch on this and then we'll, we'll bring this one to a close. And I, I mentioned it at the very beginning. Why? Because I think all of us would, would, would readily admit it's not hard to see. I mean, a quick sweep of of the Christianity that we, most, most of us have been handed is all about removal and replacement. Replacement theology is at every degree you turn. We know that. That's old news. But I want to submit that in Messiah today, it's 2022, and here we are. We are in a new covenant understanding, an epoch of time. Yes, I understand that. Much of the prophecies have come true to get us to right here. Yes. But instead of, let's examine all of our own lives. I've been doing this for the last several weeks. When I read a scripture, when I look at Paul, when I look at um, James and different things that different authors are writing in the word, I still find these things in me where I want to find a, a turning point from what was to what is. But the thing is with the word of Elohim, it's not really written that way, friend. <laughs> It's not really divided up the way man has divided it. It's not really such categorical separation where we're following. I don't believe Yahweh is seeing this timeline of one to two to three to four to five. A lot of people love to talk about covenant verbiage and, and uh, different dispensations. And well, here he did this and here he did this and here he did this. And I think that's just kind of our attempt to harness and understand what God did when, because now we know that leads to what? Now we know what we're doing. But friend, the reality is the word of Elohim is pretty clear from beginning to end that unless the end lines up with the beginning, you're misunderstanding the end. And unless you understand how the three quarter line lines up with the first quarter, you better sit here and go back and forth and really start back here because it's not here to just deliver you a whole bunch of new ideas because all of this on a building is built Torah and prophets. It's a building, friend. Okay? It is a building. All right? Now, we're not talking about like we, we, we can do spiritual metaphors all day long where sometimes a wrecking ball needs to come through and take the whole structure down. Now, that's fine when we're talking about these bodies of flesh. But when we're talking about Yahweh's works, friend, that's not how it goes. He is constantly building upon the law and the prophets. And if something disagrees with that, we have a real problem. We better set up camp back where it started because we're misinterpreting and misunderstanding and thereby setting up doctrine in a New Testament thinking that eradicates the old. And then we have a problem. So the addition principle that I presented here the other day, um, as we looked at a lot of New Testament wor uh, wording of, we know that we groan in this tent and these connections of, of having reasons to rejoice because we're in these bodies of flesh. But the continuation is this. Well, I, I don't have time to get into all that. I'm going to throw my notes on the floor. I just want to propose, in case anyone out here is just kind of struggling with this replacement theology and like, the, you know, I get tired of even saying the phrase, but the feasts aren't for me. <sighs> I'm trying to, to come up with new creative ways of saying the same thing that I always say. I believe for submission as a consideration to you, if you don't memorialize and keep Sabbath feasts like tabernacles that we just finished, friend, you're missing out. <laughs> you're missing out. Yahweh would never give these beautiful expressions of himself to become something that in any way is was a burden upon people who just don't quite have the awesomeness that we have now in Christ. 
He, I would submit to you, if we use the word of Elohim alone, He desires us to continue on remembering what He's done, what He did, and what He's going to do by the feasts, by Sukkot. Quick example, we know Sukkot is where I talked about. It pops up with Jacob, and it is, of course, then it's, it's made into a set-apart appointed time, seven days, and then the eighth day. We know this is clear as a bell in the word of, El of, El of Elohim. Most people, of course, would never agree with that, but they just categorize it, put it in a book labeled history, put it on the shelf. I'm not Israel. But if we took that out and we laid it out here and we remember, okay, we memorialize and we remember the historical fact that the people uh, tabernacled in the wilderness and Yahweh was with them and he gave them manna and he gave them sustenance and he gave them water and he put up with their endless grumbling and he... He tolerated in a tiny sense their idolatry in the sense that he kept coming back to them and extending himself to them and showing them mercy. He is the God. He is the Elohim of mercy, and he always has been. Okay, and so then what? Yeshua comes down, which is Yahweh is salvation. He comes to earth in a fleshly body, and what does he do? He tabernacles with men. He dwells among us. So the sukkah that was becomes the sukkah that is in Yeshua Messiah. And he, he personifies what? The perfect, pleasing, sinless God-man which is what? He never broke the Torah of Yahweh Elohim because he wasn't just merely sinless. Sin was what? Disobeying Torah. So he thereby was a Torah-keeping, feast-keeping, zit-zit-wearing, Shabbat-honoring, Emmanuel, okay? Tabernacling with men. He conquers the grave, rises again, ascends. Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, everybody, of course, knows that. And there's more imagery there. What? Holy Spirit sets up camp in this temporary dwelling that via Yeshua Messiah becomes a, a, a house fit for Yahweh himself to dwell, a living, living temple, a living tabernacle reality. Again, if we don't understand what that was the first time, we'll never understand what it is now. So what? In another sense, he's tabernacling with men, with me, within me. And what? I'm doing tabernacles still. Why? To remember what was, to remember what is, and I'm looking forward. So there's so much that's still ahead of us. What? Where Yeshua again will return in the same way that he left. And what's he going to do? He's going to set up a temporary millennial kingdom dwelling here on this earth, temporary, why? Because it's all going to burn up and what? A new Jerusalem is going to come down where there's no more need for a temporary abode. Why? Perfection will arrive in a new heaven and a new earth. And those people will be doing what in the millennial kingdom? Feasts of tabernacles, feasts of booze. Read your Bible if you don't do, if you're alive, in the millennial kingdom. Your son, your grandson, your great-grandson, if they're alive walking the earth during the millennial reign, if they, if you don't go to celebrate Feast of Tabernacles, you will be cursed. Okay? Why? I thought Feast of Tabernacles was eradicated in Yeshua, Jesus. No, can't be because it comes again, which means, whoa, never left. Never left. It doesn't have to come back because, friend, it never left. As I always say, we have Genesis and Revelation. We'll stick to tabernacles. Tabernacles, 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 tabernacles. Here's us. No tabernacles. Okay, millennial kingdom, tabernacles. Do you see what I'm saying? It makes no sense. So I will say all that to say this. Find people of like mind who are by thereby like kind. Find people who are odd, friend. Find people who don't fit the mold because they're everywhere. How many times in our life here, and I'll bring this to a close, I promise, we have been through so many uh, markers in our journey of a narrowing, narrowing, narrowing. I mean, friend, I could go on, I could do 10 episodes about this funnel mentality in our life of holiness and sanctification and consecrated set-apartedness. And man, the funnel, that, that, that way's narrow, friend. 
That gate's teeny now. Most don't even find it, and most that find it, oh boy, I'm not getting in that squeeze, right? We embrace the squeezing the best we can and fight it off as well at times. But every time we get squeezed more, more people fall away, friend. More people fall away. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. That's legalism. You're crazy. And every time I think, this is going to be it. <laughs> We're alone now for sure. There's nobody like us. And, and I've got to the point in my life, the last three years specifically, where I just snap out of that. I said, no, no, no. No, no, no. Number one, that's pretty arrogant. Number two, that's not true. It's not true. Because as we're coming into the narrowing, this is so awesome. As we're coming into the narrowing, Yahweh's ancient ways and his prophecies are being opened up. And there's people here, and there's people there, and there's people over there that are crazy like I am, who believe the whole Bible and say, let's endeavor to walk this ancient path. Let's come out from among them, and I mean for real, and let's be separate, let's be distinct, let's be odd. Let's really be a peculiar people. And friends, as I always say, reading your Bible in your bedroom at seven in the evening, in the quiet, and turning off your light and going to bed is not peculiar. It's not. It's not. It's time for us to come out and to be like we were here in small measure. Now, we don't have this thing mastered in any way. If there's 10 steps, we're on step two on our best day. But man, there was something beautiful about being here on this property. I don't have many people out here, but it was like, this is a city on a hill. This is some strange people who are just not like everybody else. We're not better. It's not we've attained, but there was something holy about it, friend. There was something holy. It's Yahweh's appointed times. In this case, Feast of Tabernacles. So friend, I just, I put that in your court and I say, are you, are you odd? Are you willing to be odd? According to the word of Elohim, according to striving to keep his ways, not for the sake of being strange. I'm not saying that. I hope you understand that, of course. But being a set-apart, consecrated people, friend, it will mark us. So, friend, find people who are insatiably pursuing living out this book, this one, from cover to cover. Not picking and choosing. Not we'll go do missions. But don't talk to me about the Torah. And not, well, let's just talk about the Torah, but let's not talk about going and feeding our brothers and sisters downtown. We've got to be full. We've got to be full, friends. And I believe it's possible. Everybody says, oh, you can't do that anymore. It's impossible. Well, then move out of the way. <laughs> move out of the way. I don't know. Maybe I'm even crazier than I know. I believe it's attainable. Or else it wouldn't. It's attainable if we're willing, and it's attainable if we're obedient to it. So friend, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm rambling today because I'm still stoked on the other side. My heart is full from spending time with Yahweh's people during his holy appointed consecrated time. Feast of Tabernacles. I don't know what's before us. I know it's something good. <laughs> I hope we can find it. You've been watching the Path Design podcast. We're rediscovering the ancient way the best we know how. You can find us 24-7 where pathdesign.com. Reach out to us via email, pathdesignpodcast at gmail.com. But the Holy Spirit is unveiling our eyes to see these ancient things that have gone unnoticed, unseen, and I am so thankful to be a part of it. I hope you're a part of it too. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you next time. Amen.